Imagine a world where the sun rises over endless savannas, where jagged mountains pierce the sky, and where the air hums with the calls of creatures long vanished. This is Earth 300,000 years ago, a prehistoric crucible where a new kind of ape, Homo sapiens, takes its first steps. They're not alone. Other upright walkers, their kin, roam these lands, wielding fire, crafting tools, and painting stories on cave walls. This is no tale of a single hero. This is the story of us, how we became human, how we survived when others didn't, and what it means to carry their legacy in our bones. Buckle up, because this journey through prehistory will grip you like a saber-toothed jaws and won't let go until the final word. Picture Africa's Great Rift Valley. Four million years ago, the ground trembles under the feet of Australopithecus afarensis, small apes barely a meter tall, with long arms swinging as they shuffle upright. Their world is raw, scorching days, frigid nights, and predators lurking in the tall grass. These aren't your typical apes. Unlike their tree-swinging cousins, they walk on two legs, a quirky trait that changes everything. Why? Bipedalism frees their hands, letting them carry food, gesture, or bash rocks into crude tools. It's not glamorous, but it's a game changer. Fast forward to 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus strides onto the stage, taller with bodies like ours and brains twice the size of Afarensis. They're the first to leave Africa, trekking across deserts and forests to Europe and Asia. Imagine them as prehistoric nomads, their campfires flickering against the night, roasting meat scavenged from a mammoth's corpse. These wanderers face new climates, new dangers, and new opportunities shaping their bodies and minds in ways that echo in us today. But they're not alone. By 400,000 years ago, Neanderthals hunker in Europe's icy caves, their stocky frames built for cold. In Asia, Denisovans climb high mountains, their genes tuned for thin air. And then, around 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens emerge, our species, scrappy and curious, ready to carve their mark. This prehistoric world is a crowded stage, with at least 20 hominin species playing their parts over 7 million years. Some are our ancestors, others distant cousins. Together they weave a story of survival, adaptation, and connection. The diversity of hominins challenges our idea of human. We often picture ourselves as the pinnacle of evolution. But prehistory was a messy ensemble cast. Each species had its strengths, Neanderthal's brute strength, Denisovan's altitude hacks, Homo erectus wanderlust. Homo sapiens didn't start as stars. They were underdogs learning from their kin. This humbles us, reminding us that humanity isn't a solo act, but a chorus of voices, many now silent. Evolution isn't a neat ladder from ape to human. It's more like a braided stream twisting and merging across millennia. In the 1990s, Chinese paleontologist Dr. Xin Ji Wu studied a 200,000-year-old skull from Dali, China. Its thick brow and medium brain baffled him. It looked part Homo sapiens, part Homo erectus. Wu proposed a radical idea. Human evolution wasn't a tree with clean branches, but a stream where populations split, drifted, then rejoined, swapping genes like travelers trading stories. Picture this in prehistory. A band of Homo sapiens wanders into Neanderthal territory in Europe 50,000 years ago. Around a fire, they share food, tools, and maybe more. Their children carry traits from both Neanderthal strength, sapiens cunning, DNA evidence shows 1-4% of modern non-African DNA comes from Neanderthals. In Asia, sapiens mingle with Denisovans, gaining genes that help some modern Tibetans breathe at high altitudes. These aren't just flings, they're evolutionary bridges, blending traits that define us. But are Neanderthals and sapiens the same species? Scientifically, it's tricky. If species are defined by fertile offspring, their interbreeding suggests yes. 
Yet fossil experts use physical traits and ancestry, often labeling Neanderthals a distinct species or subspecies. Imagine prehistoric debates around campfires. Are we kin or not? The answer lies in the stream, sometimes separate, sometimes one. Wu's braided stream model flips the script on evolution. It's not a race to the top, but a dance of divergence and reunion. This resonates with prehistory's chaos, groups splitting to survive droughts, then merging during bountiful years. It also mirrors modern humanity. Our cultures, languages, and genes blend constantly, just as our ancestors did. The stream teaches us that isolation breeds difference, but connection fuels resilience. Let's zoom in on the moments that shaped us. By 2.5 million years ago, early hominins like Homo habilis are smashing rocks into sharp flakes, slicing meat from carcasses. These aren't fancy tools, just the prehistoric equivalent of a pocket knife. But they let our ancestors eat protein-rich diets, fueling brain growth. Imagine a savanna scene. A hominin kneels by a gazelle's body, scraping meat while hyenas circle. That tool is their edge. By one million years ago, fire changes the game. In South Africa's Wonderwork Cave, archaeologists find ash piles, proof of controlled flames. Fire means cooking, which softens tough roots and meat, unlocking calories for growing brains. Picture a Homo erectus family huddled around a blaze, their faces glowing as they chew roasted tubers. Fire also wards off predators and warms cold nights, letting hominins spread to harsher lands. Around 320,000 years ago, symbolic thought sparks. In Morocco's Jebel Irhoud, sapiens carve red ochre into crayons, possibly painting their skin or tools. This isn't just art, it's communication, shared meanings that bind groups. Imagine a hunter painting a red stripe on his spear, signaling his clan's identity. By 80,000 years ago, sapiens are trekking across continents. Their brains tripled in size since Afarensis. They're not just surviving, they're creating. These milestones, tools, fire, symbols, aren't just inventions, they're cultural leaps. Prehistoric hominins didn't just adapt to their world, they reshaped it. Tools turned scavengers into hunters, fire turned night into day, symbols turned individuals into communities. This creativity, born in prehistory, defines us. Every modern innovation from smartphones to space travel traces back to those first sparks in the wild. As sapiens spread, they didn't just conquer, they mingled. By 80,000 years ago, they're in Asia, Europe, and beyond. But each migration shrinks their gene pool, a phenomenon called the founder effect. Sub-Saharan Africans, descendants of those who stayed, remain the most genetically diverse. Imagine a prehistoric village in Ethiopia, bustling with varied faces, while a small band in Siberia grows uniform, their genes limited by isolation. Yet, isolation doesn't last. Sapiens keep mixing, as do their traits. Skin color evolves to balance sunlight. In cloudy Europe, pale skin absorbs more UV for vitamin D. Near the equator, Melanin-rich skin shields folate from harsh rays. These aren't races, a modern myth, but adaptations to prehistoric environments. Picture a sapiens hunter in Scandinavia, his pale skin glowing under weak sun, while his equatorial kin thrives under blazing skies. By 12,000 years ago, humans domesticate plants and animals. In the Fertile Crescent, wheat and goats are bred for yield. But dogs? They're old friends, bonded with humans for millennia. Imagine a prehistoric camp, a wolfish dog curled by the fire, its loyalty a bridge between wild and tame. This mixing of genes, traits, and species shapes the human story. Prehistory's melting pot challenges our obsession with purity. 
There's no pure human. Our strength lies in diversity. Sapiens thrived because they blended, not because they dominated. This echoes today's globalized world where cultures clash and fuse. Prehistory reminds us we're at our best when we embrace the mix, not when we gatekeep our identity. To bring prehistory alive, let's explore two vivid examples reconstructed from fossils and archaeology. The Shanidar Cave Neanderthals, 70,000 years ago, Iraq. In Shanidar Cave, archaeologists found a Neanderthal man, dubbed Shanidar I, with a crushed arm and skull injuries. He lived to old age, likely cared for by his group. Imagine him limping through a snowy valley, his clan sharing their kills to keep him alive. Nearby, a grave holds another Neanderthal, buried with pollen traces, possibly flowers. Picture the mourners, piling blooms over their kin, their grief as human as ours. This shows Neanderthals weren't brutes. They cared, just like sapiens. The Laetoli footprints, 3.6 million years ago, Tanzania. In Laetoli, volcanic ash preserved Australopithecus afarensis footprints, two adults and a child walking together. Imagine a rainy dawn, the trio trudging through mud, the child's tiny steps trailing the adults. Were they a family, fleeing danger, seeking food? These prints, frozen in time, capture a moment of connection, proof that bipedalism and bonding defined us long before sapiens. These stories ground prehistory in humanity. Shanita's care and Laetoli's walk mirror our instincts to protect, to journey together. They remind us that human isn't just sapiens, but a shared spirit across hominins. Today, when we care for the elderly or walk hand in hand with loved ones, we echo those ancient steps. Why did Homo sapiens outlast their kin? Science doesn't fully know. Neanderthals were strong, Denisovans adaptable, Homo erectus widespread. Yet, by 40,000 years ago, only sapiens remain. Some say our edge was cooperation, sharing food, raising kids communally, caring for the old. Picture a sapiens band in a drought-stricken valley, pooling their last scraps to survive, while a lone Neanderthal group starves. Others point to our brains, wired for symbols and stories, binding us in ways others couldn't match. Or maybe it was luck. A volcano, a plague, or a harsh winter could have tipped the scales. Imagine a prehistoric storm, sapiens huddled in a cave with stored grain, while Denisovans, less prepared, fade. Whatever the reason, sapiens carried forward, their genes a tapestry of all who came before. Survival wasn't about being the strongest or smartest, it was about connection. Prehistory shows that our greatest strength is collective. Today, from climate change to pandemics, we face new threats. Sapiens' story suggests we'll endure not by competing but by collaborating, just as our ancestors did. So, what does this prehistoric saga teach us? Humanity isn't a single spark, but a flame kindled by countless hands. Afarensis' steps, Erectus' fires, Neanderthal's care, Denisovan's resilience. We're human because we connect, adapt, and create, weaving a stream that flows through time. The lesson? Embrace our shared roots. In a world of division, look to prehistory. We thrive when we blend, not when we build walls. Let's keep the stream flowing, carrying our ancestors' legacy into a future we shape together. Before we close the long journey through millions of years of evolution, let us pause not on the footprints, the tools, or the caves, but on something quieter, yet unchanging, the bond between human beings. Within every prehistoric skeleton lies an untold story of the first touch of longing of those quiet moments when mating was no longer just an instinct, but became something deeper. In the first dusks of humankind, 
When the wind spoke louder than language, mating was purely instinct. Australopithecus afarensis, living over three million years ago, had no rituals, no love, only body scent, biological cycles and silent signals, a lowered head, a gentle touch, a hand gripping an arm. Males often fought for access with brute strength, and females didn't choose much, only protection after birth. The child didn't know who the father was, but knew the mother's breast was life itself. Hundreds of thousands of years later, on the dusty savannas of Africa, Homo erectus had learned to stand upright and to wait. As the sun set and the first fires crackled to life, so did the glances. A pair might sit beside each other for many nights before skin touched skin. Females began choosing not only for strength, but for patience. For those who gathered wood, who shared meat, who kept watch while predators stalked the dark. Then came Homo neanderthalensis in the icy valleys of Europe. Here, closeness meant survival. Mating became warmth. A woman might lie beside a man through an entire winter. They would stroke each other with the softest furs, and the child born was given to the group. The symbols etched on bones, the handprints on cave walls, Perhaps they were the first promises made between hearts, that love could exist even without words. Finally, in the age of Homo sapiens, where crops grew and villages rose, where the dead were buried and shells became jewelry, sex gained yet another layer of meaning, a connection of souls. People grew jealous, they waited for the moon to return, they sang before touching. Couples began to grow old together, not for survival, but for something harder to name, attachment. No one knows exactly when mating became loving. Perhaps it was when the first woman chose to stay with the man after giving birth. Perhaps it was when the first child learned to name both mother and father. Or perhaps it was when the human hand, once used to grip stone and spear, learned to hold another hand instead. Under the red glow of firelight within a cave, beyond which the wind howled and beasts prowled, someone placed a hand on another's shoulder. No words, no reason, just the will to stay. As the sun sets over this prehistoric world, imagine standing on a cliff gazing at the stars. Below campfires dot the valley, each a story of survival, loss, and hope. That's our story, not one of triumph, but of persistence. Keep watching, keep learning, because the past isn't gone. It's in your blood, your bones, your dreams. Until next time, let's walk like Afarensis, dream like Sapiens, and live like the humans we've always been.